The USA is one of the few remaining countries in the world where the medical procedure of ear cropping is allowed. A few other places in the world may allow it, but have restrictions on it, such as Brazil, where it's banned for cosmetic reasons. And others, particularly European countries, have fully banned any practice of the sorts. In some places like the United Kingdom, these procedures were banned over 200 years ago, but many places have only banned it in the last three decades or so. Procedures like ear cropping and tail docking have changed several breed standards out there depending on the region. This can make it easier or harder for individual dogs to match up to their breed standard if shown in other countries than the ones that they were bred from, like schnauzers without cropped ears and docked tails being incredibly hard to finish and earn championships in the AKC standard. It's not impossible, just very difficult, and thus breeders who import from such countries that have restrictions on these procedures have difficulty finishing those new imports to add new blood to their lines, simply because by the time the dog is able to leave its mother and be shown, it's too late to alter them. The list of breeds is quite large, but some of the most common breeds are Doberman Pinschers, Great Danes, all three sizes of Schnauzers, and Boxers. However, being a show person who seeks to keep modern purebreds healthy as well as historically accurate, and seeks to help keep responsible pet owners from unnecessary or even harmful pet laws, I find it very odd that places ban these procedures and their reasoning is, it's only cosmetic. Sure, on the surface, it may seem nothing more than a cosmetic thing, and heck, I dare say 90% of cases, it is a cosmetic thing, but there's more to this subject that many people don't seek to learn about. Many people are ignorant and don't see both sides of an argument before jumping to conclusions and saying one thing is cruel and should be banned. I don't blame people for thinking like this, it's very easy to think like that. After all, even big names like the American Veterinary Association gets this stuff wrong due to their own bias, claiming it only has potential negatives with no positives. Now I'm one person going up against an entire league of trained professionals, but if life teaches one thing, it's that bias can take over the facts in something you love. Don't try to change others' opinions without seeing where the other side comes from first. It's how I got into show dogs in the first place. I may not have a veterinary degree, but I can probably say I know more about the facts due to my own curiosity and research I've done over the years than those vets who are so heavily biased claim to know. But back to the real subject here, these procedures being banned. I just don't get it. If dog shows are to help improve the next generation of dogs to keep in line with what the ideal dog of a breed would historically do, I find it weird these procedures we've done, dating back to even thousands of years in some cases, are getting banned. We would be taking out a critical part of a breed's history. It's time to break out my knowledge on these breeds and show everyone these procedures are in fact not cruel, do not harm a dog physically or mentally, and are actually much safer of a procedure than other procedures we do on dogs. Let's go! The big four we're going to talk about are ear cropping, the removal of some of the dog's flap of the ear, tail docking, removal of parts of the tail, note that this is different from bobtails, which are naturally short, Dew claw removal, the removal of dew claws, and debarking slash bark softening, the adjusting of a dog's vocal cords in order to soften the volume of a bark. We're gonna go through these one at a time with ear cropping first. So ear cropping, or cosmetic otoplasty, is a surgery in which the dog's ears are cut and positioned to stand upward. Depending on the style, sometimes up to two-thirds of the ears is cut, but in some cases, like very short crops on some bully breeds, much more of the ear is cut. For this video, I got in contact with several breeders who have cropped ears as a part of their breed standard in order to explain the lifelong effects of such procedures, and even got in contact with a few cropping veterinarians, which are becoming increasingly rare, in order to describe the before, during, and after surgery care to make sure that this is accurate as possible. The surgery is typically performed on puppies at around 7 to 12 weeks. If performed later than that, the dog will often have more painful memories, which is why most of vets who do the procedure do not do it on dogs past 12 weeks. Before anything is done, the dog has a weigh-in and general checkup, as well as describing the style of crop the owner wishes. After that, the procedure involves a general anesthesia and usually takes less than 30 minutes to complete, in some cases maybe up to an hour. 
When under, the vet carefully cuts the ears into the shape via sterilized medical tools, lasers, or special medical scissors, then stitches up the openings. They also typically clip the dog's nails at this time. Painkillers and antibiotics are given, as well as a microchip more often than not. Once the puppy comes out of anesthesia, they are given soft food to eat. Some dogs have more difficulty coming out of anesthesia than others, but that's pretty common for any creature going under. After eating, they usually go back to bed. Different vets have different aftercare, but the general is stitches are removed about 7 to 14 days after the surgery, and then ears are posted upwards. Post-op care mostly involves owners changing the bandages over the ear in order to keep the ear standing, as well as having some basic medications like painkillers and antibiotics. Cleaning the ear and changing the bandage is to keep infection away is most of it, and this usually lasts anywhere from 4 to 8 weeks, all the way up to 2 years depending on the style of crop and how long it takes for the ears to stand on their own. Usually though, most stand fully on their own by the time the dogs are almost a year old. It's very uncommon for them not to stand by them. Most dogs after having it done don't seem to suffer any long-term health or mental issues. Most often live their lives like nothing happened. This is because the surgery is performed very young and thus the dog won't remember it. It's as if you had a surgery when you were four years old. You wouldn't remember it, would you? All in all, the dogs don't have any repercussions unless something like healing doesn't set or an infection sets in, but those are pretty rare and usually come from inexperienced people doing the cropping or improper aftercare like allergic reactions to tape or infection or just plain failure to properly set the ears. So why are so many people against this? It doesn't hurt the dog and there's no repercussions. If it's done in a safe, humane manner by a professional, and dogs are given proper medication and aftercare. So what's wrong? <laughs> well, your question's as good as mine because I don't see the issue with it. In fact, it may have some medical benefits and cropping rarely causes issues. It was used and still is used to keep a dog healthy and safe while working. For starters, floppy ears are not natural. Okay, well, it's not that they're not natural, but dogs' ancestors didn't have them. We humans created floppy ears through our selective breeding. No other member of the Canis gene family has floppy ears, and that's because they're a liability. Wolves didn't need an easy target for other wolves to grab, bite, and shake off. Same deal with dogs who are working and have to fend off predators or even people. As for why dogs have floppy ears if it's a liability is different in each breed. In some breeds like bloodhounds, large floppy ears actually help by sweeping scents into their nose, but most others, it just came about because of domestication in general. If you look at the Fox Domestication Project, you'll see what I mean by it came about naturally. Early man need to focus more on workability and temperament rather than appearance, and if we could change a dog's appearance after the fact to help it work better, that was far more logical than trying to breed for pricked ears and possibly ruining the temperament. It's just like what happened with the Doberman. The original creator, Lewis, tried to have naturally pricked ears and bobbed tails, but dogs with those ears and tails didn't have the temperament and workability Lewis wanted when creating a guard dog, so he figured it'd be better to focus on temperament and workability and fix the ear and tail issue later with cropping and docking. In short, why risk temperament and workability over something as small as ears when you could easily modify the dog later with surgery? It just makes sense to put temperament first when you need dogs to work. But this doesn't change the fact that we created floppy ears via selective breeding and thus caused a liability for several dogs that need to be changed in order for a dog to work properly. Think about this. Most of the cropped breeds are working guard dogs or dogs who were historically used for fighting or protection. A floppy ear is just an easy target to be grabbed and torn off in a fight, thus causing a lot more pain and issues than if the dog had cropped or pricked ears at a young age. And if you say a dog can't rip off ears, it happens all too often in dog fights, whether accidental dog fights or purposeful dog fights. I've seen this firsthand, and it's not pretty. To someone who's already pretty queasy when seeing blood, I didn't need to see something like that in my life. People back then couldn't risk losing their dogs, so they would crop them to make it so that they would be less of a liability. They had to focus on temperament and workability, and if they could change the dogs down the line, they would rather do that than give up workability and temperament. 
Some will argue that long pricked ears are just as susceptible to being torn as floppy ears, and true, but one, most pricked ear dogs normally have proportional ears to their heads, and two, pricked ear dogs can move their entire ear forward, backwards, etc. Floppy ear dogs can only move where it is before the flop, but they can't move the flop directly. It's kind of like our pinky toes. There, but we can't move them directly. They just kind of go with the rest of our foot when we bend it. Same for the flop on floppy dog ears. Thus meaning that they can't hold them back against the head or move them directly. They thus have a higher chance of getting damaged. As for modern takes on cropping, sure. Many can still be seen as just cosmetic or to line up with breed standards as many people aren't having their dogs work. In fact, like I said in the intro, probably 90% of cropped ears are for cosmetic reasons. What are those reasons? Well, here's an example. What looks more scary, a cropped Doberman or an uncropped one? Dobermans were bred to look scary. They were the tax collector's dog, and if you were a tax collector back in the 1900s, you were hated by everyone. Having a dog with cropped ears to make it look demonic and is literally nicknamed the devil dog would deter people from eating fighting in the first place, keeping you safer. The cute look of floppy ears would have the dog look way less scary. In fact, losing cropping would change the breed's look forever. When the cute version of a dog grows to become the breed, the original respect for the breed is lost. We see Dobermans as powerful, courageous, and fearsome because of how they look, but take away a key part in that, the cropped ears, and it just isn't the same. You can't let that be lost. That's the whole point in dog shows in the first place. The to lay out the ideal looking and temperament of a dog. If you take away cropping, you ruin it. And honestly, I don't have the same respect for uncropped dobes as I do cropped dobes, and a lot of people feel that way. And for true working dogs, those ears need to be cropped or else they create the risk of bleeding out if torn. Modern takes on the procedure have far more precautions in place to prevent a dog's death. I can't exactly find how it was done before 1950s, Crops back then were much shorter, so posting wouldn't have been needed. But from what I can tell, dogs were still put under, but the ears were not stitched up and they are not given medications. That's relatively new. But nowadays, there's anesthesia, careful sterilized medical tools, after-op care, disinfecting products, and many more. I think it's safe to say that dogs back then with such little medical knowledge could survive that version of the procedure. Oh yeah, modern dogs can totally have no issues. But still, people claim it's only a cosmetic thing with drawbacks and no potential positives. Okay, what about the health benefits I mentioned? Other than, as I mentioned, floppy ears being a liability in working dogs, dogs with cropped ears that stand upright can pick up slightly more sound than dropped eared dogs. Yes, any dog has hearing far better than humans, but pitch perfection, floppy dogs do not. It's a very slight difference between hearing, but it's still a difference. Floppy ears also cause issues for ear infections and ears that do not get enough oxygen. In breeds like, say, the Newfoundland, a water rescue dog diving into sub-zero temperature to save people, if they get water in their ears with little oxygen, it makes it a humid, moist environment for bacteria to grow. And once an ear problem sets in, it's damn near impossible to remove it for good, especially if it's in the inner ear. Now this could just be my experience, but having seen all kinds of floppy-eared breeds have more infections and hardly any with pricked or cropped ears, I think that shows a lot. Now some people will mention that floppy ears on those said water dogs seems very counterproductive. After all, if the ear being down and thus blocking the canal of air is part of the reason infection sets in, why aren't they cropped? To that I answer, thickness. The ear lather on most water and sporting dogs that have dropped ears are much more thicker than the ear lather on other breeds. As such, they don't tend to move or flop around as much and provide a nice buffer that's water resistant between the water and ear canal. Yes, water can still get into the canal, but it won't as often as it would if the ears were cropped in this case because the thicker ears mean it will move less likely. As such, thicker, floppy ears for water dogs are what's better for them rather than cropped or upright ears as those would pretty much guarantee water entry into the ear. So in this case, floppy ears are beneficial to those specific breeds. But the key word is those breeds. Not all breeds benefit from floppy ears and instead may actively harm them. 
diving into water is far different from fighting other dogs or fighting other people to the death. So why do people have issues with it if it doesn't hurt the dog and possibly has benefits? I think the main issue is how it's portrayed and how it used to work, because much like horse racing, it's evolved to be far from the awful perception it used to be. Even in modern times, inexperienced people try and crop for themselves, namely for dog fights or puppy mills because no good vet is going to crop for a dog fight. They're the people that cause the issues. They don't use the proper tools and equipment necessary to do it right. They don't have the proper knowledge. All they do is cut, tape, and pray that the dog doesn't bleed out. But a certified vet who knows what they're doing and takes it in a timely manner and does everything they can to minimize pain and discomfort. In other words, like many things in the world, judge the person, not the procedure. But it doesn't help animal rights activists show everything in the worst light possible. They seek out that one in a billion chance of an issue and show that to be way more inflated than it really is. Tell me, have you ever actually seen an ear cropping procedure that was not influenced by animal rights activists? They show it as cruel breeders cutting ears with garden scissors and letting dogs bleed out. That isn't what it is by a long shot. Look at Crot's show dogs. Do they have issues with people touching their ears? No. Often they don't have any issues. Most live their lives as if they never had surgery. They don't remember having floppy ears. Animal rights activists try to make it seem like the worst thing possible when it's really not. But because those people manipulate the minds, most people assume it's true without seeing what it's really like. If big name clubs like the AKC of all people knew something was truly cruel and harmful, would they support it if they want the best, probably better than you, for dogs? I'm not sucking up to the AKC, I'm just putting it out there. Breeders who have spent decades with these breeds wouldn't support it if they knew it caused harm or issues. Purebred dogs are bred with a purpose, and if that purpose is to go out and fight to the death, we want to minimize that risk for death. We had to back then, we couldn't risk injury. While dogs nowadays are not fighting to the death, those that do need to minimize injury. And even if it is just for looks, it keeps the respect that the breed deserves without causing any harm. Next up is tail docking. Now before we go any further, we need to differentiate the differences between docktail and bobtails. Docktails are surgically altered, whereas bobtails are dogs who are born naturally tailless. Australian Shepherds and Old English Sheepdogs are the most common of these breeds that are bobtailed, but there's plenty more. Now, not every Aussie and Old English has bobtails. It's a genetic thing that's too much information for this video, but if they have a tail and are in a location where it can be docked and has to be short via the standard, they will be docked then. But it's about a 50-50 when it comes to bobtails and docktails. As such, standards in those breeds where docking is illegal, a tail is usually allowed as or as either or. One is not favored over the other. And even in places where it is legal, it's usually not one is favored over the other. In this case, both types of tails are okay. Anyway, moving on. Docking tails is a procedure in which the dog's tail is, well, removed in order to make the tail smaller on a grown adult dog. Some only have about one third of the tail removed, like on poodles. Others can have a larger area removed. And of course, bobtails, like I mentioned, which are naturally short. Much like ear cropping, this is a historical procedure for working purposes. However, unlike cropped ears, this kind of thing is seen in far more breeds than cropped ears, namely in gun and herding dogs, as well as working dogs and terriers. The procedure of tail docking usually takes place when puppies are just a few days old, usually only two to three days. The procedure differs between individuals. Some will do a quick snip with a pair of medical scissors, or some may tie a band around the tail to cut off circulation. Stitch up with a few stitches or sometimes skin glue and you're good to go. Now this may seem painful, especially without anesthesia, but remember, Puppies are only two to three days old. They can't even see or hear yet, much less remember. As such, puppies don't remember. They may feel a little pain and yelp, but they're so young that they won't be able to remember it. You don't remember having a memory from anything that happened from when you were a few weeks old, do you? 
As with ear cropping, most dogs don't tend to suffer any long-term health issues from having dock tails, and in some breeds, specifically ones with longer hair, it may be beneficial so the tail doesn't get soiled by feces or urine. As for why we dock tails, it's the same thing with cropped ears, working. However, unlike cropped ears, this one is present in far more breeds. While most cropped ear dogs are some kind of working or guardian dog, dock tail dogs are from herding, sporting, terrier, working, and plenty of other groups. This was done to prevent injury. Now, dogs do use their tails in a variety of ways. Body language and basic dominant submission shows pointing up for dominance, hiding it between the legs for submission, wagging it in happiness, and even holding the tail high to allow scent from the dog's anal glands out. This last reason is part of the reason that dominant slash confident dogs hold their tails high. Another reason is balance. A dog can move their tail to one side of the body to oppose the tilt, much like a type where walkers balance bar. There are a few breed-specific examples of more tail usefulness, like in northern breeds such as Malamutes, using their tails when covered up to sleep in order to cover their noses. Water dogs have thick tails to act as a rudder or buoy for dogs in the deep. Tails also help with movement, quickly changing direction to match the head while the lower body takes a few more seconds to catch back up to the same positioning. Dogs do use their tails, but at the same time, a tail is much like a floppy ear in the fact that it's an easy target to attack or get injured in work. However, unlike ears, canines have always had tails, so we couldn't change that. Needing to focus more on workability, we decided that we could go alter a dog after it was born to make sure it could safely work. An example would be the long tail on, say, an English Springer Spaniel. The Springer needed its double coat to stay warm, but having long fur on the tail could easily cause hair to get stuck on thick brush as it crawled under to work. Plus, burrs could stick in the fur and skin. As such, removing most of it would result in hopefully less chance the dog's tail would get caught. Plus, the nice added effect of helping Cleep clean was another good call, even if it wasn't the main draw at first. Working guard dogs who have tails could easily get them broken, and a tail that's broken pretty much never heals. If your dog gets a broken tailbone, that tail's not getting better and may as well be permanently damaged. If the tail gets stepped on by a heavy hoof of a horse, that tail is as good as gone. And yes, I said gone, I did not stutter. If a dog is quickly moving around, like most working and especially hurting dogs, it is possible the dog's tail can get ripped off as the dog tries to run away while a heavy weight holds it down. Yes, this is possible. Uncommon, but still possible. All in all, not something you want to deal with. Plus, I don't need to mention happy tail for those who have dogs that love to wag them against the walls and break open the skin. But wait, I hear some of you say, dogs bred for similar purposes with similar appearances may not have dock tails. Say, an English pointer versus a German short-haired pointer. And true, both English and German short-haired pointers have short, smooth coats and were both bred to work in marshlands pointing at the game, but German short-haired pointers have docked tails whereas English pointers do not. Well, other than historical locations changing how we alter dogs, you need to realize how the dog works can make a big difference. Here's an example, Border Collie versus Australian Shepherd. Borders have tails, Aussies do not. Have you ever seen the difference based on how borders work versus Aussies work? Borders sneak, stalk, and quickly bite then retreat for herding. They stay away and keep a good distance only going in when needed. Aussie dogs say, fuck that, I'ma jump right in there and be under yo feet at all times. Aussie dogs are all in front of their quarry. They get in their faces, they show that livestock who's boss, and they get in the way. Borders, being more sneaky and holding back, could keep their tails as it was less likely to be stomped on because they tuck it in. Not to mention, what are border collies known to herd? Sheep. Okay, now a sheep can be anywhere from 100 pounds to about 350 depending on breed, size, age, gender, etc. Chickens, no more than 10 pounds. Goats, 2 to 300, to spreading from breed and whatnot. Alright, now your average cow on the other hand is anywhere from 1600 pounds to 2400 pounds. If a dog gets its tail stepped on by one of these two animals, what do you think is going to hurt more? 
Many people forget the type of quarry a dog has to work with can change why it may or may not have a tail. A cow is gonna hurt if it steps on you, and yes, it can break bones. Take back on what I said about fast-moving dogs getting its tail stepped on in movement and ripping its own tail off as well. Many herding breeds with tails kept their tails because they weren't herding two-ton animals. Of course, not every breed follows this trend, but most do. Early men couldn't afford to lose their dogs, so by docking the tail, they would prevent a disaster down the line. Docking a tail at two to three days won't be remembered as well as a four-year-old dog getting its tail stepped on by a 2,000-pound heifer now, will it? So issues with docking? It's the same thing as ear cropping, how it's portrayed. So many people think breeders take a pair of scissors and let loose when that's not the case. Now, tail docking is much easier than ear cropping, and some breeders do know how to do it on their own. But a good majority would go see a vet if they felt at all unsure about anything. We don't just take scissors and pray. It was like that long ago, but nowadays it's not like that at all. And there's a reason it's done so early. The tailbone hasn't fully really developed, so one doesn't need to worry about tailbones breaking that early. And the dog won't remember it. It's far better to dock at a few days and at a few weeks or even years. And remember what I said about animal rights activists being crazy and taking a one in a million chance and inflating it to stupid proportions? They try to make everything they don't agree with seem like the worst idea in the world. Hmm, this is another video idea. Extremely rarely, if ever, do dogs have complications from tail docking. I've never heard of a dog with a docked tail having any issues with it, and many go on to live perfectly normal lives without their tails. They live just as well as other dogs, minus for the ability of Happy Tail to ruin their and their owner's days. We had to decide what was worse, docking at a young age so to make the tail short in life, or risk the tail becoming a liability later in life. And I think early man made a good call by docking.